Good morning. Glad to have you with us again today. We are still in a COVID environment. We're meeting and God is blessing. Uh, we are ma wearing masks at church the whole time we're there. And um, yeah, we're having a great time of worship. So if you're able to come, we invite you to come and join us. And uh, God will just bless your heart. Thank you for joining with us today. Today I want to uh, continue thoughts we've been looking at the last uh, two weeks. Look at uh, just relational ministry, the ministry of the gospel, but in context, in the context of the end times. We're going to be looking at that in the weeks and months to come. And, and just simply looking at uh, reminders to us, and, and to, I want us to take encouragement today and in this series that uh, God has plans uh, to use the church now as he always has. And what a great opportunity we have. We live, we live in, a, in a time and a moment of great opportunity. And so our prayer is that uh, God would use us in a mighty way in our relationships for the gospel, for the sake of Christ. So we just uh, talk to the Lord today as we begin. Father, just touch our hearts. And um, by your grace, remind us that you have enabled us uh, just for everything that you would call us to, to testimony, to witness, to laying Christ before our hearts and then before our culture who needs a Savior. Lord, we pray that you would just today move our hearts and stir, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at this idea, I want us to start at uh, in the Old Testament. I just want us to look at simply uh, indicators. Indicators uh, that God gives to us that uh, reveal the character of man, the hearts of man, as we uh, move toward and are in the last time of ministry. So we're going we're gonna to start there, and we're just going to move forward. We're going to start with the concept, as we think about relational ministry, we're going to think about people and, and what, what we see in our lives and the people around us. We're going to start in the days of Noah. That's, that's the appropriate place to begin in Genesis, because Jesus refers to that himself in Matthew 24, verse 37. He simply says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Lord returns. And uh, when the Lord returns, when he comes back, the, the, the characteristics of the people of the world are going to be uh, similar to the time that it was in the times of Noah. So I want us to, to identify that, to see that, and, and to move forward. What we see here is this, and, and it's, we start in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, it refers to the time of, of Noah here, that God simply was, it was an afterthought. As people lived and breathed, they simply didn't obey God anymore. The world in totality didn't obey God anymore. They weren't listening to God. They weren't searching for God. They weren't looking for God. Uh, he was simply something now over here out of the box and not a part of their active life, not a part of their devotion, not a part of relationship at all. As it was then, we see that same reality today. They were immersed in the here and the now. They lived for today. They were eating. They were drinking. They were marrying. They were given in marriage. They were doing all of this until the day that Noah went to the ark and closed that door. There's nothing wrong with any of those things individually. But the picture that's, that's uh, posed for us and shown to us here in this verse is simply this. They were simply going through life, and they were, they were living for the gusto, and they were, they were filling their life with as much as they possibly could. And God wasn't a part of that picture, as we've seen here. God, God was completely on the periphery, if even that. And so they were just living life every day, just trying to get the most out of life without a relationship with God. And so they just lived for here and for now. We face that in our culture as we engage people. Genesis chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. They took as their wives any that they chose. And, and they were simply living for self-gratification. They saw a beautiful woman, and that's what they wanted. And they went after a beautiful woman, and beauty was, was exalted, and it was elevated. And, and that was the standard. And... Uh, for decision making as far as a wife and that kind of thing it was just very self it was self gratification and and they simply live for that and god marked the number of the days that this generation here had because of because of the sin of their life verse 4 of, of chapter 6 we see here the, the uh, nephilim and we could say a lot about this there's this is a this is there's controversy in this passage and that's for another time but, but as we move into this verse, we see that, that, that uh, these individuals, they were, they were mighty men. They were, they were giants. They were men of renown. Uh, the culture was, was uh, infatuated by these men. Myths were being born because of, because of these men. And uh, there was, in a, in a sense, there was that, that almost a hero worship element uh, to these men who just had 
seemed like renowned capabilities, and they stood out. They stood out from the crowd, and 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 the world idolized the stories of these people and and uh, the legends of these people. And so, you know, we live in a culture that's exactly the same way. We just exalt. We just exalt people, and we and we place them on a pedestal of all, almost a mythic proportions, and uh, they, they become uh, celebrities and heroes and, and all these kind of things. And 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 God is given a backseat. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 reminds us that there was a simply great wickedness on the earth. That every intention, every thought of the heart, even, even if they didn't act it out, everything in their heart was simply evil continually. And it's still true today as we look at our world, the qualities that were taking place here, the qualities we see around us and, and uh, in us. Verses 11 through 12 in the same chapter, there was just a corruption. It filled the earth. The earth was corrupt. The earth was filled with violence. And... Uh, Everyone, all flesh, was corrupted in, in, on the earth. Job, Job, as he refers to this time, and, and many place Job uh, at the time of, of Genesis. And uh, Job, in his book, he says this. He defines the people of the time. They would say to God, God, I don't want anything to do with you. Depart from me. Uh, what, what, what can God do for me anyways? What can the Almighty do for me anyways? What has he done? What's he done for my life? And those are questions and those are attitudes that we confront when we engage people in today's culture. So there was just a defiance. There just was a, a view of God that said he's irrelevant. We come to the Tower of Babel and, and, we, and we see again just a mindset that it is true today. We see in chapter 11, verse 4, uh, as the people gathered together, they simply said this, let us, let us build for ourselves, let's make a name for ourselves. The priority here among the people was not to honor God and, and, and to follow his command to fill the earth. It was, it was to stay together and, and become important and become a self-made people and become self-reliant and to stand apart from God and, and to thumb their nose at God and, and build that tower to the heavens and thumbing their nose against the authority of God. Again, we engage that and we, and we, and we experience that as we engage our culture. We look at the time of the judges. And we see qualities that happen here in Judges that are just true today. And these are, this, these are here are not necessarily indicators of end time, sign-wise, but they're, but they're so true even today. Judges chapter 2, verse, verse 10, the people simply didn't know God anymore. Israel didn't know God anymore. They did not know the Lord or the work that he had done. It wasn't a part of their life. They didn't talk about it. They weren't aware of it anymore. They had forgotten and lost all that God was and all that he did. And our culture has forgotten and lost all that God was to this nation and, and, and to us and our Ju uh, Judo, uh, Christian, Judeo Christian heritage. We've, we've lost that place of God at the front, in, in front of us. And so we face a culture that's, that's very much the same way. Verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2, they simply provoked God. They did what was evil, they abandoned God, they went after other gods, they bowed down to them all the way through Scripture. One thing that continually comes out over and over and over and over and over again is, is the sin of idolatry. Simply relegating, taking God off the throne and filling God, filling that place in our lives with, with anything else but God. And so they provoke God and they provoke God to anger. They provoke the Lord to, to respond and to judge them. There's their sin until they re, would repent. Judges chapter six seventeen verse 6, and uh, everyone did what was right in their own, in their own eyes. There wasn't a leader that, that led them as a king. There wasn't a leader that led them morally, spiritually. And people simply lived by their own standards. They defined and set their own standard. There was a self-centered, there was a self-oriented code of conduct. You know, that's the culture that we live in today. When we engage people, we're engaging attitudes just like these. In the book of Daniel, we see this as well. Chapter 12, verse 4. It, when the time of the end comes, when the end time comes, he says here that that knowledge is going to increase exponentially. You know, we're living in that time. Knowledge is, is just every day increasing and growing, and, and technology is changing every day. And, you know, you buy something brand new, you, you've got that new cell, you've got that new phone, you've got that new tablet, you've got new devices, new things, and you know what? In a year, they're obsolete already. In two years, they're obsolete because knowledge is changing so quickly. And yet it says here in this verse that they were running to and fro the earth. In other words, they were... They were searching. They were looking for answers. They were looking for meaning in life. They were, they were looking for something that, that would cement them and, and change their life and give meaning to their life, and they couldn't find it. And even though they knew all these things, there was no peace and there was no relationship, and they were empty inside. And we engage people in our culture today that are, that are uh, at the same place, a place of great need. 
And as you just think about the people in your life and, and what defines their life, these qualities, they stand out, don't they? They remind us of people that, that we know and they remind us of tendencies in our own heart if we're not careful and if we don't let the Spirit just kind of take control of our life and, and fill us and lead us and guide us and direct us. And, and so this is always the battle of the flesh. And so we're engaging a culture where these are the values of the culture and these are the experiences of the culture. We come, we come to the New Testament and we continue to see the reality of this. We come to the uh, Matthew 24, verse 3. And so Jesus is teaching and the disciples ask him right here, what are, what are the signs of the coming? Signs of your coming? Or what's the signs of the end of the age? And here they're specifically referring to when Jesus is going to come back. Jesus, when are you going to come back? And, and how can we know that you're coming? What are going to be those signs? What are going to be those indicators? So Jesus, as he answers in the first eight, he says this. He says, everything I've told you and will tell you, these are simply birth pangs. They're, they're the beginning. They're the beginning of what's going to happen. And when they happen, they're going to start going doo -doo 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 -doo, like that. And as, as birth pains, uh, as, you, as we draw closer, those pains get sharper and quicker and sharper and quicker and sharper and quicker. And ladies, ladies, you know all about that. I, I don't. Us men, we, we can't identify that. We don't know that. And so what we're looking at here today are not, are not specific signs as to the second coming of Christ. That's at the end of the tribulation. But these are indicators that reveal to us that we are in the end times. These are indicators that show to us the, the quality of the hearts of men, the characteristic of the hearts of men, the, the, uh, the tone of our culture as it relates to the people of the culture, how they view God and how they view each other and how they view believers. And so in Matthew, we come here to the Olivet Discourse, and Jesus is teaching his disciples before he ultimately here goes to the cross. And, and he, so he begins to answer the question. He says, in the end times, there's going to be false teachers. There's going to be false messiahs. Specifically, there's going to be here false messiahs. As we move into that tribulation and towards the end, there's going to be those who claim to be, to be Christ. There's going to be those who claim to have the authority and the power of Christ. There's going to be the anti-Christ. There's going to be the false prophet. There's going to be all these things. But, but one of the marks of the end times in which we are living, and we're living in there now, is simply this, that false teachers are going to rise up. And they're going to, they're going to give a false narrative about life. And they're going to give false truth. And they're going to, and they're going to give uh, false information about God and about priorities and about values in life. We're reminded there's going to be uh, war all around us, wars and rumors of wars. And these aren't qualities of, of a person's heart, but it reveals the heart. We fight because of the because of the battles that we have within. We fight because of because we're so self-oriented and we can't get along with each other. And so it reveals the heart here. And wars and rumors of wars are just going to increase more. It's going to be famine. There's going to be earthquakes. Uh, it will increase for the believer, for the church. There's going to be just increased persecution. They will deliver you up, that's the believer, to tribulation. They're going to put you to death. You're going to be hated. In fact, all the nations are going to hate you. You know, there's still some sense, some kind of refuge in the United States for believers. Rare is the place in, in, in the world anymore where there's a haven for believers, where there's a country that stands uh, with believers and allows them the freedom to express freedom of their worship. More and more, the world as an entity is simply becoming closed to, to um, the worldview that says we value believers. We, belong, we value those who are in Christ. And our nation right now is changing as well. Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. Believers, believers in name, many are going to fall away. They're going to fall away from the church. They're going to have made professions, but they're going to fall away from that. They're going to, it's going to, their, their, their profession of faith ultimately is going to be revealed to have not been true and not, and not, not been genuine before the Lord. And they're going to turn on each other, and, and it's going to be, it's going to be just, just chaos, uh, even among those who are self-professing. But yet, at the same time, something really good and positive is Jesus says here in verse 14 of Matthew 24, the gospel of the kingdom is going to be proclaimed throughout the whole world. The gospel is going to penetrate every nation, every, every nationality, every tribe. And you know what's happening now? In fact, the tribes and the, and the world and the nations have come to the United States. Think about that. We're just one country of, of so many, and yet look at the nations are here. And the gospel is, is penetrating, and those peoples and those peoples are going back and have been going back to their nations and having impact. And, and the word of God is being fulfilled here. First Thessalonians, we see the reality here of this. Um, there's going to be a false sense of security. And there's going to be a false expression of peace. People are going to... Are going to come to the place and say there's peace and there's security and there's going to and this is really a, 
uh, a political in nature, and this is this is worldwide in nature, and the, and Israel is going to have a false sense of peace, and that really gives us a picture of how how they view their relationship to the Antichrist and the, and the world around them in the tribulation. So this is kind of more of a tribulation thing, and yet. And yet what's going to happen is it's just simply this. There's just going to be that sense of everything's okay. And, he's, and the Lord reminds us here, you know what, but it's not. Because in, in, in just a twinkling of an eye, in a second, in a moment, everything's going to change. Destruction's going to come upon the, upon the earth and upon the world. And, you know, when we get complacent, God reminds us we can never be complacent. Because if we remain complacent and apathetic and take God off, take God off of the page, then we face ultimately the consequences of that. And many times they're sudden in our life. First Timothy reminds us, again, as we've said, many are going to leave the faith. In, the, in latter times, some will depart from the faith. They're going to turn away from Christ. They're going to turn away from relationship, and they're going to turn, they're going to, turn to, to false faith. They're going to turn to false religion. They're going to turn to false worldviews, and they're going, to be, they're going to be captured by worldviews that pull them away from Christ. Uh, there's going to be those who speak into their life, and it will speak lies into their life and speak untruth into their life, and they're going to pull them away. And we engage people in our culture that have been captured in bondage by false teaching. And what an opportunity that we have. One of the things that's going to happen here is, is that consciences are simply going to be seared. Seared against the truth. Seared against relationship with Christ. Seared against the gospel. As we engage today, we, we, we see that reality as well. Timothy reminds us at the end times that there will be artificial standards that will be elevated up and, and lifted up. There are going to be those who forbid marriage, which God has given to us. Those who will set up false standards of, of what we can eat and can't eat, require abstinence from foods that God created uh, to be received of thanksgiving. You know, we see that even today. Spirituality uh, is, is sometimes or, or where I stand in, in righteousness or purity or whatever often is indicated by, by what I eat and what I don't eat, and that, that begins to define us. It defines us more than our relationship with God. And then we impose that on others, and, and to the unbeliever, it's even going to be more than that. And, and so artificial standards are going, to, are going to be lifted up in our life, and that's going to determine. We're, we're going to feel comfortable within those artificial standards. We're going to expect others to live by those as well. You know, well, when we engage people today in our culture, this is what we see, and this is what we have, this is what we speak need to speak to, and this is the reality of of what we're encountering when we bring the gospel to a lost world. Second Peter reminds us that people will scoff at God; they're going to mock God. Uh, in the last days, it's just going to grow. Our culture today just does do that with more and more regularity on on the on the media. We just see God being being uh, laughed at and not taken seriously, and and the in TV shows, God is irrelevant, and he's, and he's, and he's laughed at, and Christians are as well. And, and more and more Christians are seen as, as, a, as a laughingstock of the earth, one point of view, or seen as, as uh, just absolutely dangerous to culture. And they will mock your message and my message. And, and uh, for believers, we'll seek to just be an agent of the gospel, of good news, of the truth, and express that, to share that, and we will be put down because of that relationship. They will follow their own desires, verses, verse 3. Scoffers are going to come. They're going to follow their own sinful desires. They scoff and they mock believers and you and me because they because they they love their life. They love the freedom of doing what they want, when they want, how they want. They love having no accountability. They, they love the ability to, to just to dysfunction how they want, want. And yet at the same time, while there's a there's a fulfillment in their life to be able to do that, there's a, there's the deepest of empty of emptinesses in their heart, and and they're searching and they're looking and they're never satisfied and they never find the peace that only God can bring. And ultimately, there's unbelief as they scoff and as they mock here and Peter specifically, they're going to scoff and say, you know what? God said He was going to come and He never has. You know, it's been over two thousand years already. The Lord has promised He's going to come back. He's never He's never come back. He's not coming back. Where is God? Um, and so they're going to mock not only that promise, that reality. They're going to mock the word of God. They're going to mock your word. They're going to they're going to say it's hateful, it's bigoted, it's mean spirited. It's not it's not for today. It's old fashioned. It belongs in prehistoric times. It's not enlightened. It's not truth. All the, the various things that are that you may encounter when you simply try to to share the truth of God's word. James reminds us as well that. Uh, in the last days, where people, the world will simply be 
consumed with the things that we can acquire, all the stuff that we can own, the gold and silver, uh, the treasure, the stuff that we can have with our hands, our fingertips, we can buy and we can own and we can ex we can enjoy and we can experience. And, and, and James shows the folly of that. And our world, as we engage people, we're engaging materialism. We're engaging those who are who are just completely 100% caught up in having the best of the best and having something better than the next person and more money than the next person and, and, and finding and trying to find fulfillment in things and in money. Revelation in chapter 18 speaks to the system of Babylon. That's a whole discussion. We're not going to go there, but it goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. It goes back to the world's, the world's desire to stand opposed to God, separate from God, and we live in, we live under a system and we, the world system is this system where it seeks to, it seeks to simply uh, uh, operate outside of God's parameters. And so here, here is the destruction of the world system. It's the destruction of everything that has held the world together, the glue that has held the world together. Um, and so all the, all the merchants, all the money, all the things are going to be destroyed. And here it says uh, the nations were deceived by this marketing. The nations were deceived by the materialism and the consumerism. And, and people were simply have fallen, fallen in completely to the lie that if we just live and own and, and buy as much as we can, we're going to be happy and we're going to have meaning. And, and we have been deceived and tricked by a world who has put a false promise in front of us that can never fulfill that. It's going to be destroyed. And it mentions we're deceived by their sorcery. That sorcery can be witchcraft. It can be all those things. But sorcery is that word in the Greek pharmakia. It can, it can also simply be just be deceived by, the, by, by filling my life with a uh, with uh, potions, with with um, with medicine, thinking medicine is the answer to my life, but we live in a culture more and more where often medicine is the answer. It is it is the missing it is the missing piece in my life. We just we think and we just we fall into that trap where we think if we just have the right medicine, the right diagnosis, the right doctor, that my life is going to be complete. And we do that without even considering and realizing that the most important thing is a relationship with Christ. 2 Timothy 3 is a significant passage here. We're just going to read through it quickly. There's going to be great difficulty. Understand this, that in these last days there will come times of difficulty. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. As we share Christ today, it's going to be difficult. It's a challenge. Our love is going to be misdirected. It's going to be other things. It's going to be ourself. We live in a culture who lives for themselves. We live in a culture where money, money is king. There's an emphasis simply on, on, on me, myself, and I. Just the attitude, people are going to be proud and arrogant as we, as we bring the gospel. The response against, the, against that is going to be, I don't need it. I don't need that. I'm okay. Relationships are going to be damaged. We live in a culture where relationships are so damaged. People will be abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. All of these hard attitudes, all of these actions, all of these things that, that become a part of the way we live is just is destructive in our life and it's destructive in relationships. And I minister to people every day where there's destructions in their relationships. And in all these years I've had in ministry, I've just seen the reality of this. And, and Satan is so insidious and he, what he promises never fulfills. And instead it destroys and it breaks down and it wrecks. And relationships get destroyed. And we're, we're bringing the grace of God into, into brokenness. And uh, what an opportunity we have. 2 Timothy 3.5, there's an artificial spirituality. And yet, and yet people who act like this and engage like this and function like this day in and day out, there's something about them that comes across. They have an air of, of a, what godliness or spirituality. Um, how, amazing how we can be almost a Jekyll and Hyde. We can portray ourselves as so uh, good and right to, to, to those when we want to. And yet underneath and behind that, that Jekyll and Hyde is just a sin nature. And it just comes out so quickly and so swiftly and it's so destructive. Because ultimately there's no power. Uh, there's an appearance of being right with God. There's an appearance of doing the right thing by the standards of this world. And yet there's no power. There's no transformation. There's no heart change. Uh, there's no peace. There's no hope. Or to avoid such people in the sense of adopting their worldview and, um, and embracing them. But we are to engage them for Christ. And they will take advantage of weak, weak people. 
our culture consistently is 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 just beating beating down and taking advantage of weakness in our minds and in our hearts. There simply is an opposition to the truth, 2 Timothy 3 8. Men who oppose the truth, they're corrupt and they're disqualified in the faith. We live in a culture where the truth of God is opposed continually. So what are we to do? What do we do here? I want to close here and I want to look here at Colossians chapter 3. It's a familiar passage again, but it's a reminder to us. Colossians, I mean Colossians 4. Paul prays at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Paul prays for effective evangelism. He prays for it verbally. He prays for it uh, in his life. He prays for God to work. God's called us to bring the gospel. We've seen that the last two weeks. We've seen, we see that as a, just simply the purpose of the church. So what do we do? We communicate. We're to communicate. We're to communicate the gospel. How do we engage this world? How do we engage a broken world? We communicate the gospel. We communicate God. We communicate who he is, the sovereignty of God, that we ultimately are accountable to God. He prays that God would do this and this and this, but ultimately he is he is elevating here the authority of God. We looked at this passage last week, kind of bringing a different different way of looking at it this week. We're to pray, and as we pray, what we're doing as we pray, we're elevating that relationship. God is God is most important. God is the one to whom we are accountable. When we give the gospel, we're presenting God. We're presenting who He is and man's need for God. We're presenting the Word of God. We're presenting truth. Verse three that God would open a door for the Word. And so everything that we do is based upon the Word of God. Everything that we communicate is based upon the Word of God. And the Gospel is based upon this. It's not, it's not our opinion about how someone's life has changed or how they earn their way to heaven. It is the grace of God. It is the provision of God through the Word of God. Everything that we communicate, if it has power, is going to be because it comes from the Word of God. We, we are to communicate with the Gospel, Jesus Christ. We declare him the mystery, the good news of Jesus Christ, of relationship with Christ. And so as we communicate the gospel, we clearly talk about the need for relationship with Jesus Christ. We clearly talk about the fact that sin is a, is a, comes between us and God. He prays that we would walk in wisdom toward an outsider. To walk in wisdom is to be in relationship to God. It's to, it's, it's to have the experience of being a part of the family of God. And yet we're talking to who? people who, who are outside of that experience, who don't have that relationship. And it's a reminder to all of us that we were in that same place. We were, we were separated from, from God completely. We had no relationship. And it reminds us that, that as we take the gospel, we're speaking to people who've, who function this way with the qualities that we've seen this morning, who function this way because they have a need in their heart, they have a need in their life. They treat you and I the way they do because there's a need in their heart. They hate Christians because maybe a pain in their life, maybe because Christians have not, have not lived for Christ the way they should, and, and Christians have been hurtful. Maybe they hate Christians because the truth speaks against the sin of their life. Whatever that might be, there are scars in their life. All of us have a need that only God can meet, and we need to have a sense of urgency. Verse 5 and 6, we're to make the best use of the time, we're to redeem the time. The days are evil, the Lord's going to come, He could come at any time, and so we're to be active with the gospel. And so as we give the gospel, what are we to do? We're to proclaim the word, okay? We're to communicate that word. We're to convey the word of God. We're, con we're to communicate the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. What are we to be? Now here's the thing. Here's the joy. When we communicate the gospel, we're communicating more than just words on a page. We're communicating more than just a message. We are, we are conveying that, that relationship is joy. We're, we're conveying that Jesus Christ is joy in our life. We're conveying that every touch with Christ is good and positive. We're conveying here that, that relationship is a celebration in our life. Gospel, the gospel of Christ is good news. You know, if that doesn't come through our life when we share the gospel, that we've not shared the gospel. We've shared it with our words, but we haven't shared it with our life. If our life is joyless, if our life is, is lacking grace and love, if we're lacking the very qualities that that the Lord transforms us to be. And then we share, we stand as a barrier between the message and, and God himself. We are ourselves a hurdle. So 
So what we need to do and what we need to pray is that, that we would be, in our own life, a living testimony. And so what we convey is this, that relationship with Christ, it's an honor. Relationship with God, it's an honor. We convey this, that my relationship is an honor. It's an honor to me to be able to know God, to be able to talk to God. We pray because we honor that relationship, because we need the Lord. We pray because it's God who opens doors. We pray and we share the gospel because he's changed our life. We pray because there is something organic between God and me. We share the gospel because we love God so much because of what he's done. And we that love comes out of our life. Our life is a celebration because of God's word. God's word is powerful. It's not just powerful in the gospel message. It's not just powerful to change your life. It's powerful because it's changed my life. And when we celebrate and speak in a positive manner about the standards of God's Word, the truth of God's Word, the expectations of God's Word, when we love His Word and it permeates our life, when it's not just words on our mouth, verses that we've memorized, but it's also verses that have impacted and been infused into our life, then our life is a celebration. When we stand strong and with courage and with joy when we're going through difficulties, then we are a celebration. The celebration is this, it's Christ. The Christ is good news. He's good news to us. Everything that Christ did is good news. Everything he calls us to be is good news. His expectations for you and I as a believer, it is good news. As we communicate that, the gospel, your life and mine, we need to, we need to, our life needs to be in harmony with the message of the gospel. We're asking someone and saying to them, you need Christ. Then our life needs to be conveying this, that I love Christ more than anyone else. Christ is, is the most important thing in my life. That he is good news. Whatever he calls me to do, whatever he asks me to do in obedience, it is good for me. And I will embrace it with that attitude and that mindset. And I will celebrate continually what I have in Christ. We need to celebrate that God is transforming us. As we speak to the gospel, we speak of the reality that changes lives. Don't we? The Lord can change your life. No matter what scars, no matter what disappointments, no matter what doubt, what discouragement, the Lord can change your life. If people who know us don't see that our lives are being changed, if they see us always sharing the words of Christ but never changing ourselves, we will lose power in that witness opportunity. God needs to be transforming you and changing you. We walk in wisdom. We walk in relationship. We are being transformed. To walk in is to have a life witness. And we celebrate this, that the grace of God is stirring our own hearts. It's impacting our own hearts. We make the best of the use of the time. How? By extending the grace of God in our speech and our words and our actions. We are a people of grace. And the first thing that needs to be true is this grace of God needs to be stirring my heart. It needs to be impacting my heart. I need to be a person of grace I need, to view, I need to view everyone I ever encountered through eyes of grace. And I'll never do that unless I'm a person of prayer, unless I'm yielding to the Spirit of God and to His Word. Otherwise, my, my vision will, will be cloudy. My vision will be, will be unclear. And I will see people through my own lens, and I will not see them through the eyes of the Lord with grace. And so what do we do? What do we do? Just, just in closing, we have to share Christ. Where to go as we're going? We're to make disciples. We're to share Christ. That's, that's our final challenge here this morning. Let us share Christ together. Let us do it consistently. Here we see in Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, watch your life, watch your doctrine closely. Those two need to be in harmony. Your life, how you live, and, and what you communicate and what you say with your words. Those things need to, need to harmonize together with the Word of God and with the testimony of Christ. Our life needs to be combined with truth. With grace, with words, our life needs to be a celebration of what we convey as to our worldview. The gospel needs to match up. We need to do it with power. The power is this, that the Lord is changing us. The power is this, that we're overcoming uh, the challenge of sin in our life every day because we're yielding to the Lord. We're casting off, we're saying no to sinful to sin in our life, to the patterns of sin. And, and, we're, and we're standing in the power of the Word of God, the armor of God, so that He would be our strength. Be our power and we're helping others to learn that those victories and we're showing them Christ and and at the end of the day we're showing them the power of Jesus Christ and we do it with love we do it with love we share the gospel we do it with love 
Love defines us and becomes our testimony. We do it relationally. You know, we've mentioned these books. Just a reminder, just a good way of closing and just reminding us. This book here, The Art of Neighboring, is, is about relational ministry. It's about knowing your neighbors, the neighbors in your life and right around you, and caring for them and reaching out to them. It's a reminder to us that it, it, it takes conversation. It takes people who genuinely care for their neighbor. We must genuinely care for the people in our life and learn from the Word of God how to ask questions, to engage them, uh, to communicate with them, to ask questions that, that take that take relationship to a, to a deeper level and give us an opportunity to convey the celebration of relationship with Christ, to convey in truth those words of truth. And so, and so we need to be learning and always growing in our ability to do that. And we need to do it in our life, realizing that it's never going to be easy. Our culture is changing. What a, what a challenge we face. And that God would touch our hearts in today's culture and, and realize what an opportunity that we have. That opportunity is this, that the Lord would take your life your life and my life and use it to reach people for Christ. The people in our life. Who is it that's in your life, yours alone, that God would have you to reach? How would he, how would he have you to use your life, the consistency of the testimony of your life and the word of God in your life? How is your life a celebration of everything that God has done? May that come through in your witness and in your testimony. May you and I be intentional in difficult times. We are, we are living in a culture that's changing. But you know what? There are believers who are living in a culture that has changed for generations already. And they are facing persecution in every generation, every day. Their life is threatened. We don't face, we don't face anything like that. Yet our culture is changing so much and so drastically. And we are indeed living in end times. And God wants to use you. He wants to give you that blessing. He wants to encourage your heart. He wants you to know that He wants to use you in a relationship in your life. He wants you to be praying specifically for names of people who need the Lord. He wants you to be identifying in your own life ways that you can live in harmony with the Word of God, the truth of His Word. He wants you to, to know that the Word of God is power, that as we learn it and embrace it, that we are prepared to share the gospel, good news, with others, that they might receive Christ. May that, may that pierce our hearts. May it stir our hearts. It impact us today. Father, we pray again that we would be soul winners. That we would care about our own lives, our walk with you, and that we would care about people who need the Lord, that those things would harmonize under the, the power and truth of Jesus Christ, that you would compel us to move forward with grace and love and be reaching people for Jesus Christ. To that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, what a privilege it is to love the Lord and to impact people with grace. May we do that well. See you.